What's up, guys? It's Coach Scaglione. It's another edition of the Powerlifting for the People podcast. I got my man, Christian Anto, on the line today. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Awesome, man. Uh, so people that are listening in and maybe they aren't familiar with who you are, can you just give us a little background who you are and what you got going on right now? Who, who am I? <laughs> um, as, as Coach Gags uh, said, <laughs> I'm Christian Anto. I am um, with Team Elite FDS, um, powerlifter. More so a coach now than a power lifter. Um, I have doing it for ten years now. Um, very competitive in the one eighty one weight class. That is kind of my box, if you will, um, where I stay competitive at. Have done one sixty five. Have done one ninety eight. Um, man, went through the typical progression of being a meathead. Um, not knowing anything about the sport of powerlifting, and then transitioned into getting uh, exercise sports science background and education, um, interning at the University of Memphis with their uh, collegiate teams in that setting, and then was also doing internships in a private setting. So that's kind of where I was molded um, and ended up going to the private sector that's where I stayed, and that's where I still reside now, 10 years later. Um, still in it, uh, still doing the same thing that I was doing 10 years ago, uh, which is learning a bunch of new stuff, because uh, there's always new stuff to learn. So um, still have a drastic love for powerlifting, um, and I'm more focused on athletes, gen pop clients, and powerlifters. So it's a very... I'm not even going to say it's a broad spectrum because all three of those categories train similarly under my methodologies. So it's not considered broad spectrum to me. All of those spectrums, I basically tell people if I were to give an elevator pitch, I'm a strength coach that can make anything with muscles stronger. So I literally, whether it's somebody that wants to be able to garden without hurting, I can make them stronger through my methodology to let them enjoy their hobbies outside of the gym. Or you have the freaks of nature that live in the gym that want to go beyond all means to get as strong as possible, to lift as much weight as possible. So both ends of the spectrum, I I fall in the category of helping all of them. Yeah, and that's that's kind of where like the powerlifting for the people kind of terminology came about. We do believe that strength really is for everyone. Uh, sure. it, it sounds cliche, but there's definitely a level. Like I said, I always kind of use you know the example of like my my parents. I kind of forced them into the gym. Uh, they're in their sixties and they get a great benefit. And we also have some you know lifters that like yourself that compete at like a national level that I've worked with over the years. So. Um, so what were some of like your best lifts? I know like you were kind of chasing that like 10 times body weight total for a while. What were like some of your best lifts if you, that you could remember some of your – share some of your iron cred with, uh, oh, with the listeners? Um, n- never – I shouldn't say never. I have yet to reach that 10 times body weight total. Um, my best total actually was while working under you at 1770 at 181. Um, in a competition, I believe best numbers were 715, 380, and 680. Um, best overall lifts ever in the gym, 715, 3, I think I hit 405 once in my life. (laughs) Just once. And I've deadlifted seven. No, several times and never have been able to yeah. put it together for a meet. So, I, I, and if I feel you. any insight into how meets go, <laughs> I have deadlifted anywhere between 660 and 700 dozens of times yeah. and have never, ever in 10 years have been able to put it together on meet day. You wouldn't- so. Yeah, sometimes you gotta like kind of go around that that number. I've 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 kind of been in a similar boat. I've I've uh, I pulled seven hundred in the gym as well, and I haven't done it in a meet yet. Uh, but I do plan on it. It is on my bucket list still. I do gotta get that monkey off my back. I also I don't even care if I have to take a token squat. We'll <laughs> exa- exa- exactly, exactly. <laughs> I, th- I also think people don't realize too, like when you are such like a, you're a really big squatter, uh, you, your squat's still like one of the top all time at 181. Uh, it does take a lot out of you, believe it or not. Like when you when you <laughs> when you squat in a big weight like that after. So uh, it is it's de- funny. It always finds a way to bite back in some way, shape, or form. And I had to laugh because 
you sent me a, a kind of a screenshot earlier, and I remembered that training day because I made the title. Hey, I took seven hundred. It was easy, but it bit back, yep. and I actually had my SI shift not a little bit, but a lot of yeah. it out on that because I I was like, oh, I got it, and I let all of my air out when I wasn't fully stood up, and I heard a yeah, and I was like. Oh man, I'm going down, and I literally racked the bar and went straight to the I, floor, I rem- and that took like I, three weeks to come back. From I remember. It. So it's funny. <laughs> I remember watching the video and going over the coach, and I was just like, "Oh boy," I'm like, "Are you I'm like, are you okay?" <laughs> but uh, it all it also goes to show you too when someone sees like a little snapshot or something, it's like they might see, this looks that looked really easy, but they don't see like kind of the aftermath of the kind of the damage kind of done. So um, maybe kind of like this is a good. Uh, kind of way that we could transition into like talking about um, what are some kind of things that you've learned over the years, powerlifting? I know like you, you've had some ups and downs. Um, I thought you did really, really well. Um, like I said, the, you know, the, the, the couple of, uh, you know, the training cycles that we did together, but what are some things that maybe you learned, maybe some do's and don'ts for maybe some people that you see that are kind of getting, they're just getting into the gym or just getting into competing. Like what advice do you have for some of like the newer lifters based on like what you've learned over the years? I'm so happy you asked me that question. <laughs> um, this is going to apply for people that have been in the game for a while and brand new. The majority, when I was in my most competitive, the majority of people do not do enough volume on accessory work. I'm not talking about the main stuff. I'm talking about yeah. accessories where they are, they're so taxed from, and from my own bias, I, I heavily rely on the conjugate system. Um, they're so taxed by main movements and secondaries that they're just like, oh, I have to get through my ex- – and that is the worst mindset to possibly have in that structured system that I found people just either skipping it or looking at during, – during consultations, looking at what they have. And I was like, what is this – for like are you actually just doing this to do work right like jump volume or is this applicable to what you actually yeah. need as a lifter and um so the volume aspect of things and individuals not building their base if you will i there's so many one-sided powerlifting athletes that and I'm hearing it more now than I ever have before of they're gassed out on their deadlift and they're just like, I just don't have enough stamina. And I'm like, you've been doing this for years now and not once have you ever done anything except max effort, secondary movements, accessory movements, and taken a step away from specificity and then transition yeah. back around to build that base. So understanding the concepts of powerlifting of yes there are hundreds of different ways to get stronger that's why there are hundreds of thousands of different coaches they all have a means to get individuals stronger not all of them are the best suited for everybody but there's it, it always comes back to the basics of these are basic principles that work this is why they work and so many people don't want to incorporate all of them they just want to incorporate the sexy stuff, right? So jump volume and, and going through the process of taking care of your body as a lifter to kind of like a well-rounded education. If you're going to school for a particular degree, you're not just going to go to those classes, although we all wish we could. You have to take prerequisites, and there's a reason why you take prerequisites because if you don't, you're going to get to the main stuff and you're going to be like, I have no idea why this applies to anything. Same concept applies. My methodology, GPP, is going to apply to strength in the long run. Hypertrophy is going to apply to strength in the long run. So, Understanding so the, why you're doing for it. For the new people listening, so what, what classifies as GPP? So like, what, is that, what does that mean to you? So GPP is a shortened term of general physical preparedness. The way that looks to me, if you are interested in powerlifting – Everything outside of powerlifting. That means you are doing things that are very metabolically stressful. You're not touching a barbell. You're doing a lot of body weight movement stuff. You're physically moving your body in a way that does not emulate 
squatting maximal loads, benching maximal loads, deadlifting maximal loads. However, you're moving your body in a way that it is physically made to do so that you are not one-dimensional and only able to do certain things. If you want a good example of what a one-dimensional individual is, go look up some really old power lifters and just look at how they move. <laughs> Um, I'm fortunate enough at the facility that I'm at right now to, it's almost like a time capsule. We have guys from the original quads gym at nice, our facility. Nice. And we have individuals that are just stumbling into powerlifting. Like, dude, that's, that's almost three decades, possibly four decades worth of lifters. Yeah. And you can physically see the, the quality of... Uh, the quality of life even, but like the quality of movement from that gap. And you can see as a coach, you can instantly see, wow, that's what they missed for so long. But then also as just a, a random spectator, you're like, man, he looks rough. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's, it's things like that where it, it's my beliefs. And this all ties back to this is why we – um, had such a good relationship coach and athlete because our methodologies are similar in you believe in having that ability to move and build upon that strength yeah. and that's the way you coach people you teach them you're a teacher you're an extremely good teacher that's what I try and teach my individuals like my whole thing is I don't want my clients to need me for a long period of time I want them to be able to go off and I want them to be able to progress on their own if they need to. But I also want them to understand, like, I can walk into a gym if I don't have a coach or a training crew. And I can actually do a training session that I know is beneficial to me that I could use someone as a reference point or a lifeline. Like, they can reach out to me and be like, hey, did this, this, felt great, this happened, I don't know why, what are your thoughts? Like, the perfect world for me. We have a really weird industry where a lot of people are like, I, I need these people to like rely on me yeah. for everything that they have and it's not the whole pick whatever phrase that you want for me it's live learn and pass on because Elite FTS has poured a lot into me you've poured a lot into me and you can see if you pull me apart as a coach and as a lifter you can see some of your methodologies instilled into me yeah. and how I coach people um, Dave Julia and a, I can rattle off hundreds of other names of people that the majority don't know and it all comes back down to they're not super fancy at all <laughs> they are not trying to be in the limelight at all they have a massive retention rate of individuals that respect them for what they do and they never have to change anything that they're doing and they're always consistent and I, I heard a podcast with Dave recently. Um, I think it was Dave and Brian Carroll. And Dave was talking about the individuals in the industry that are trying to do the next hottest thing that are going to get big bucks. Once something like this happens, right. they're going to have trouble. Yeah. But guess what? The people that have been in it for 10, 15, 20 years, they're still going to be here doing the same thing. The only downside is those are the individuals that are never going to make that ridiculous amount of money that they did, but that's not what we're after. So I don't know. It's just uh, with the whole pandemic now, you're seeing a lot of stuff come out and you're like, yeah, I've been seeing that since like day one. And for day one, for me, you've taught it to me. Julia's taught it to me. Dave's taught it to me. Everyone's going to hit a wall, whether you're a power lifter, a coach, or just someone that's involved in this realm, you're gonna hit a wall. And if you can last in this industry for more than seven years, if you can get to the 10 year mark, you've made it. And I use that in air quotes because even people at 10 years I've seen fade out. I think that's the start. I think that's, what we, that's the decade mark is like yes. when it's like, okay, now like, I kind of like have an idea of like, I know what I'm doing a little bit, <laughs> you know? And it sounds like for someone that's like six months in, it seems like a while, but I mean, it's been like, you know, I'm entering my next year will be my 15th year as a coach and as a, and as a competitive lifter, com sure. competitive lifter. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, and I'm like, I still feel like I have so much to grow. And that, that's one of the reasons why I always respect you is you're, you're a student of the game, no matter how like accomplished you've been, you've always opened to learning. Um, and one of the things I think I had actually had a conversation with, uh, Andrew Herbert, uh, 
uh, a week or two ago, and we were talking. There's like kind of a big difference between a lot of like of pr- just pro- programming and coaching. And I definitely kind of swing, and that's I've I've actually been a little bit of a knock on like what I do a little bit. I'm a little bit when I send you guys a program. Sometimes it's a little bit. It's not. Ex- I don't give you exact weights to do. I don't. I'm not like holding your hand like the whole time. I want there to be an open dialogue and that's kind of by design and sometimes people don't understand that. Like some people like want, hey, it's like, no, I need you to like kind of make the decision because especially if I'm not there with you real time, like you need to like learn like how to warm up yourself. You need to like learn like how to like pick your like RPE or like pick your like weight. You got to like learn how to like what jumps are good for you. Like I can't decide that for you, especially if I'm not with you like live, you know. Um, that's like really important as a lifter to kind of like learn your own body and learn what works best for you. And then we have a conversation. Okay, well, this didn't go well. Like, how do we troubleshoot? How can we do this better next time? And that's, I think that's really more of the coach I say is like, um, you know, I always use the analogy of like uh, driving and, you you know, a coach is more like a GPS. It's going to like reroute. It's going to help you kind of get there. But at the end of the day, you're the one driving the car. And you're the one that gets you to the destination. That's why I know we were talking before. It's like, you know, you help, you know, like, you know, you, the athlete does the work. The athlete's what gets them there. The coach is just kind of helping them along a little bit. They're not there to like, I'm not driving the car for you. You know, you got to drive your own car. So I think that's a really great lesson and you shouldn't need me forever. And of course, I think I, I like to, you know, work with people for a long time and I have some athletes, you know, I've worked with five, six plus years still. Um, and I think that's really cool, but at some point you got to like kind of take control of your own, your own training for sure. So I think that's, that's awesome. Um, you know, what has your transition been like? Obviously you're, you're still an athlete, but now you're focused a little bit more on coaching. What has that transition been like for you? And what are some things that you're kind of like working on like currently, uh, with yourself as a coach? From a comical standpoint, my transition now is keeping these new kids at bay because everybody thinks they're on some like super massive strong kick so i don't know when it started i have no idea i've been at this facility going on two and a half years now and now everybody has it out for me like everybody like i'm gonna i'm gonna catch you all this stuff and I was like, <laughs> where did this come from <laughs> like if i'm doing my job you should catch me <laughs> like I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about you not killing yourself on the way to <laughs> not just catching me, but beating me. So the majority, the majority of the individuals at my facility that have graciously started to work with me are younger. Um, they're in their early to mid twenties, and it is just a riot. So when I transitioned up here. I was down south in Memphis, Tennessee, transitioned. We're just outside of Chicago right now. Zero clients. Zero. I went from a facility that went from the old school powerlifting facility and it took a massive step to this new weird transition of big powerlifting facility that had anything you could ever want and clean. It was super weird. Like it, it's nothing you've ever seen before. Like it had two monoliths, three racks, mondo hack squat, like all the big stuff that like smaller gyms. Are like man, I wish we could have it all of it in one place. Um, so then coming to this gym that like equipment super old. Like we literally have original pieces from the quads gym in our facility. Um, the mirror that we have in front of the dumbbells has the quads nice. gym logo <laughs> and location and phone number on it. Like it's super cool. Um, That's really cool. But transitioning not to have the fanciest best equipment. If you know what you're doing, you should be able to do exercises anywhere. So having the equipment, the fancy stuff that means nothing. People back in the day were getting super strong at just a barbell. So that was the first transition to me of, okay, this is these are my kind of go-to exercises. How do I make them work in this new facility? Second one is I had zero clients. Like I went from having 30 plus hours a week in-person clients to nothing. Ironically, and, and it's a big thing now, online clients are like huge. Like everybody needs to have a coach. So there was this massive pendulum swing for me where all these people hopped on online programming. And it's still to this day, online programming is still like crazy good and in-person programming or in-person clients or whatnot, somewhat low. However, 
I put together a powerlifting team. And because I was more focused on coaching, now Very in nice. two years our powerlifting team went from two people and now it has 23 yeah, amazing. assistant people on the team. And I'm talking people from the age of 55 all the way down to the age of 19 and some of them have never done it before. So you want to talk about running the spectrum, writing a program that has minor variances in it <laughs> for individuals, like the, they call it like the rule of three. Uh, Buddy Morris talked about it years ago where everybody in a football weight room can't all do the same thing. You have to have at least three different variances of super difficult, moderate, and easy for them to break down and do. Try writing a four-day conjugate split doing that. Like some people get bands and chains. Some people don't get it at all. Yeah. I just after last training cycle pulled all speed work because out of 21 people, I had three of them doing it right. I'm not going to have three people getting the stimulus and then 20, yes. 19 people screwing it up. You know what I mean? So um, that has been one of the biggest learning experiences for me because I get 23 people to see how things have worked and tested and we just had a mock me and it was phenomenal i had 14 people do a mock me and only one individual did not increase their numbers now granted it was a mock me they were still pretty strict on like hey that doesn't count this wouldn't pass whatever at the end of the day they're still moving more weight than what they originally were doing 16 weeks ago so having that kind of information for me as a coach is like amazing so learning a lot more here going to less seminars and whatnot just because family now all that kind of stuff gym running a team whatever not an excuse but i'm learning as a coach in a completely different way and i get people with drastic drastic body differences ailments, all this stuff to work around, um, got in contact with really good therapists in the area. So my networking has drastically increased by that shift, um, by coming up here. So the powerlifting team is definitely the biggest learning experience and change for me, being able to hone in on that, being able to train similarly to them, see what works, see what doesn't work, apply it to them. And then kind of, I'm the test dummy. And yes. I have test dummied it on me and Julia, and it's failed. Like, it's failed miserably, and it has taken its toll on me from a physical standpoint, taken a toll on me on my total in a competition, and then I can apply it to everybody else, and it ends up ironing itself out. We're going to have to uh, cut cut this short, but I definitely want to do a part two because uh, I'm really loving the conversation, and it's been good. To, it's Selfishly, I want to catch up a little bit more. Uh, a couple of things I want to harp on. I totally get you on the guinea pig thing. That's one of the reasons why I still compete. Uh, because at this point, like, I don't want to say I don't care about my numbers anymore, but like, especially going from super heavyweight down to one ninety eight. Sure. You know, I'm totally, I'm mentally okay with like, if I hit my all time absolute numbers, like, I'm okay with that because I'm like a different person now. I'm like chasing. I never thought I'd be chasing a Wilkes PR or things like this. Right. But but but. Um, you know, I'm having a lot of fun. And like I said, for me, like I get to troubleshoot and learn too, uh, about like when I was super heavy versus when I'm 198, like how leverages change and how my, you know, oh my God, I got a brace. I don't have a belly anymore. So I actually need to brace and, yeah, dude. and, and imagine things like, like it just unlocks your potential as a coach to help so many more people that are in that same issue area. Yeah, so I totally get it. It's uh, it's really cool, and I really love that. Um, I think you're gonna learn so much building the team because I remember like we started our powerlifting team about like eight years ago, S- similar kind of thing. I was a lot of my wrestlers started to graduate, and I'm like, you want to do this meet with me? And it was like it ended up, and then <laughs> and now like you kind of see like the progression of it. I never thought like powerlifting would be like my main like business, and it just kind of was a passion that kind of turned into a career and it's been amazing. So it's, it's funny because everyone hates on it. Like, Oh, you never make money off a of power. List. You're like, eh, no, no, you can. If you're good at it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that there's always uh, a market for helping people get stronger and it just depends on whether you're competitive or not. It's another thing. Uh, Christian's been amazing. We're going to have to, we're going to go part two for sure. Uh, cause right. I'm really enjoying the conversation. I do have to hop on another call, but, uh, just where can people find you if they want to find more about, uh, you and your in your gym, and if maybe if they're in the area, once uh, things blow over, of course, 
they could check um, out the gym. I'm a coach out of a gym called Ileana Power Asylum. Um, that information is on my website, which is mohawkmethod.com. You can find me on Facebook at a n t underscore t o e. Um, same or Christian Anto. I'm sorry, that's Instagram. Facebook is just Christian Anto. Instagram a n t underscore t o e. Cool. So I'll include all the links in the description and we'll definitely uh, touch base more because I just enjoyed uh, – we're kind of BSing a little bit. We had to <laughs> cut our interview short but still a lot of great tidbits in there. Definitely give Christian a follow if you're in the area. Uh, check out the gym as well because I know uh, it's definitely on my bucket list when, when I'm allowed to get on a plane <laughs> playing yeah, again. Right? Uh, thanks so much and I uh, yeah, hope wish you guys the best and uh, you know ho- I hope all your clients are doing well. If the interview helped you, please give it a five-star review. It helps other people find us. Check out the links in the description. Thank you guys so much for listening, and until next time, stay strong, and we'll see you soon.